morning, Northside. Glad you're here today. Glad you chose to be and worship together with us. I don't know about you, but most of us like things to be fair, right? Kids like things to be fair, uh, especially kids. Adults even like things to be fair. Corey told me that I had 28 minutes, and I am positive that Wayne gets 30, and that's just not fair, right? I mean, I need those extra two minutes. In fact, I informed him that Romans chapter 9, which I was assigned, is a tough chapter. In fact, New Testament scholar N.T. Wright said this about Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. He said, it's as full of problems as a hedgehog is of prickles. <laughs> I could really use 48 minutes, I told Corey, but he just laughed. And he said, 28, that's what you get, so I better get to it. Some would argue that chapter 9 of Romans is about the doctrine of predestination. And many would say that it's about the role of Israel in God's redemptive plan, including Israel's salvation. But what I would like to do today is I would like to focus on God himself in Romans chapter 9, particularly the theme of the faithfulness of God. Yes, Israel figures in heavily in this message because we can't avoid that. Israel is part of this chapter. In fact, it is God's dealing with Israel that bring to light the question of his faithfulness. Really three questions. Has God been faithful to his chosen people? Has God kept his promises to them? Has God been fair to them? Now, I know it's very likely that all of us in this room will ha won't have the same view maybe on this chapter, and a few might have some strong opinions, and that's okay. The opinion we have to have together is for Jesus. Amen? That we're going to serve Jesus together. We're going to love Jesus together. We're going to share Jesus with others until he returns. So what I hope to accomplish in this message this morning is that we would have a greater and deeper understanding of God. And since I only have 28 minutes, I hope that it will also encourage you to dig into the scripture a little bit better. If there's some stuff that you still have some questions with or you still maybe don't understand or are still wrestling with, get in and dig into the word. So let's get started. Romans chapter 9, here we go. We're going to start with verse 1. And here's what Paul has to say to us. In the presence of Christ, I speak with utter truthfulness. I do not lie, and my conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm that what I am saying is true. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to forever be cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. They are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's special children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave his law to them. They have the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Their ancestors were great people of God. And Christ himself was a Jew, as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. And all the church says... Amen. We'd agree with that, wouldn't we? Two things are very evident in the first five verses here. It is that Paul's incredible love that he has for his own people, the Jews. Man, he loves them so much that he's willing to give up his own salvation if they might be saved. The second thing that is evident is that the majority of the, zoo, of the Jews are lost. That's why he has such a great heart for them, because there's so many of them that aren't making the choice. Paul goes on to explain how blessed the Israelites are to be God's chosen children. And in spite of these blessings, we know that Israel has failed. When the Messiah appeared, the Jews rejected Jesus. They crucified him. And no one knew this better than Paul, for he himself in his early days had persecuted the church himself. How can such a blessed nation be so lost? Paul goes on to raise this question in verse 6. He says this, Well then, had God failed to fulfill his promise to the Jews? His answer, we're going to see, it's a big no. You see, God is faithful no matter what men may do with his word. Capital W, John says Jesus was the word, right? No matter what man did with the word, whether they believe it or they crucify him, God is still faithful. I want to use three major points this morning from Stuart Briscoe, uh, from his commentary, that kind of, I think, will help us understand 
how we can trust God's plan that God is faithful. So here's the first one. The word of God is not invalidated. The word of God is not invalidated at all. And we're going to see this. In the end of verse 6, Paul answers his question. Has God failed to fulfill his promises to the Jews? And here's what he says. He says, no. For not everyone born into a Jewish family is truly a Jew. Big old exclamation mark there. We'll come back to that. Just the fact that they are descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. For the scripture says, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted, though Abraham had other children too. This means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. It is the children of the promise who are considered to be Abraham's children. For God has promised, next year I will return and Sarah will have a son. I had the privilege of going on the college life ski trip this January. I got to help drive the bus. And my beautiful daughter, Brooklyn, uh, was on that trip and had the uh, joy of watching um, her boyfriend uh, propose to her up on the mountain. And so it was a very special trip for me to go on and very exciting. But on that trip, we had a night where we, get, we go skiing, we get back, we're tired, we get all cleaned up. And, and usually we have some free time to either rest or to, to, to do whatever. And I sat down at this table with this puzzle. There were all these puzzles and games there, and I sat down with a puzzle, there were a bunch of them, and I got the box there, pull out all the pieces, and start to kind of put it together. Sarah McKinnis comes up to kind of help me with it, and we quickly noticed that what was on the cover of the box was not what was in the box. <laughs> There's a problem there, right? Uh, as you start to do that together, when you got a puzzle more than, for me, more than 20 pieces, um, that ain't coming together when there's 500 pieces and the picture isn't there. The key is not there, right? I need that key. Well, we quickly discovered as we counted through it, there weren't even enough pieces to let alone put the puzzle together. The key is important. And I really think, I want to go back to that chapter 6, or verse 6, that second part of that verse, because this is the key. Paul says, not everyone born into a Jewish family is truly a Jew. Is Paul crazy? Is this crazy talk? No, I think he's talking about two different groups. He's talking about physical Jews, and he's talking about spiritual Jews. Two different groups that are going to be very important for us to see the two different groups that he is showing. All Jews belong to the first group, right? So if we were to draw a circle, I'm not an artist, so bear with me, and we put physical Jews in this circle, right? Everyone born unto Abraham and the covenant, that includes all of the physical Jews, all of Israel, right? But then Paul says a lot of them are lost. There's this small section that are the spiritual. So we'll put that right in the middle. They're still included. They're part of the whole family of the Jews, right? They're a part of this whole nation. The second group would be only those that are part of Abraham's faith, the spiritual Jews. I, w I had all this stuff and all this study uh, that I was doing, and I had a couple whiteboards with all this stuff on it and, so and some of this stuff up on the board, and Corey came in this week to kind of talk about what the service was going to be like and what songs and how the videos would go and, and what, what are you going to actually preach and how long is it going to be? And I said, well, I need 48 minutes, and that's where all that came from. And uh, then he was seeing all that, and he goes, this is kind of like the word church, isn't it? And I go, oh, yeah, it kind of is. We say the word church, but it means a couple of different things, doesn't it? I even said last night, Brenda's like, well, where are you going after you, after you go see your mom and help your mom? I said, I'm going to the church. Nobody was here. It was just me, right? According to us that really understand as believers, that really wasn't the church because we are the church. The church is us, the people. It's not this building. We could sell this building and it could be anything other than a church. This isn't the church. But yet we still use that verbiage sometimes to say, I'm going up to the church. We're going up to the building so there's really, if we were to do this about the church, there's a church building, the physical building, but there's also the spiritual side of the church, which is us, the people. And that's what we have to understand about this section when we're talking about Israel, when we're talking about the Jews. There are two different things that are being looked at here. God's promise, promises included everything that was listed in, chat, in verses 4 and 5. When Paul went through and listed all these great things about the Jews, all those promises were true. But covenant promises are not always salvation promises. Sometimes they're just physical promises. In fact, in Jack Cottrell's commentary, he does a great job of breaking this down for us, and he calls it um, covenant choices, covenant service. And he says that the physical uh, Jews 
were chosen to service. The spiritual Jews chose salvation. Got to make sure I spell right here. I just went to school in Kansas, so I don't always spell everything right, so bear with me. So there's a big difference here between the physical Jews and the spiritual Jews. And this chosen to service is very important. Personal salvation was not among the unconditionally guaranteed promises enjoyed by the entire nation of Jews. This blessing was only promised to the spiritual Jews. This small section in this circle, the small section in the middle. Abraham actually had two sons, right? That's what he says in this passage. Ishmael was the firstborn by Hagar, and then there was Isaac by Sarah. Since Ishmael was the firstborn, right? He had the inheritance. He should be the one chosen, but he wasn't. It was Isaac who God chose. Isaac and Rebekah then experienced the same thing. They had twins, and those twins came. And the firstborn should have been chosen, right? He had the inheritance, but the younger was chosen to serve. the. In fact, here's what we know. God does not make his choice based on the physical. Who should have the inheritance? Or on their character or their conduct. Well, how do we know that? Because God told Rebekah, before those twins were even born, that the younger would rule over the older. So it wasn't based on anything those boys would do. God chose. God chose the younger one. This section of scripture uses Isaac and Jacob as examples. There is a blood covenant with both. And he uses this example to show how the sovereign plan of God is going to happen through his people. See, blood is required on both sides. On the first side, it's a bloodline. Right? It's going to happen through Abraham's chosen people, through the Jews. On the second side... There's a different blood that is needed, and we all know what it is. It's the Messiah. It's the blood of Jesus. There's a difference between these physical and spiritual, and there's a difference between the service and the salvation. This is going to help us understand all the rest of chapter 9, I believe. It really helped me as I got into my study. The fact that God chose one and not the other is where we sometimes have a difficult time in our human mind. I know I do. It seems to indicate that God is unrighteous or unfair. Obviously, there were others having trouble with it because Paul had this chapter that he puts in there for the church in Rome. So let's see what Paul has to say in this second section. The sovereignty of God is illuminated, and we'll see the answer here. Okay, in verses 14 through 18, sovereignty of God is illuminated. Here's what Paul says. What can we say? Was God being unfair? Of course not. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So receiving God's promise is not up to us. We can't get it by choosing it or working hard for it. God will show mercy to anyone he chooses. For the scripture says that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you, and so that my fame might spread throughout the earth. You see, God shows mercy to some just because he wants to, and he chooses to make some people refuse to listen. Now, wait a second. That sure does sound like he is making a choice, right? He's choosing on which side or the other. The question Paul is specifically answering is whether God is unjust because he called the Jews into his service, while at the same time condemning many, if not most, individual Jews to hell. If God is going to use them, is he not obligated to save them? Remember, we're still talking about the physical Jews. We're talking about them being chosen to service, okay? This place of the Jewish people in the plan of salvation. He's not dealing with the fate of individuals where we get into the spiritual Jews. Paul shows that God is a just God full of mercy and full of compassion by quoting Exodus chapter 33 verse 19. Remember in our, in our verses that we read, God says to Moses, I will show mercy to whom I choose. I will show compassion to whom I choose. This was right after uh, Moses had been given the law. And then when he went down with the law, what did he see? All the people uh, bowing down to this golden calf, serving anybody but the one true God. So he slams the tablets down. When he goes back up to see God again, God says this, I will show mercy to whom I choose. Then I will show compassion to whom whom I choose. Why do you say that? Because God should have, could have, had all the right in the world to just take all of those people out. 
They disobeyed him. They were serving another God. That's what would have been just. They deserve, they deserve condemnation. But instead, the whole nation, even though they deserved to be destroyed, he only destroyed 3,000. He only killed 3,000. Not because 3,000 were more wicked or less godly, but purely because of his grace and because of his mercy. See, you and I aren't any different. All of us deserve condemnation, not mercy. But praise the Lord, God is a God of mercy. Paul has told the Romans earlier in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorified standard. And Paul now goes on to quote another example in Exodus 9, verse 16, and he uses Pharaoh as an illustration this time. Moses was a Jew, Pharaoh was a Gentile, but yet both of them were murderers, right? Moses was a murderer, Pharaoh was a murderer, he, kill, he was killing all, ordering all the Jewish boys to be killed. Both saw God's wonders, yet Moses was saved, Pharaoh was lost. God used Pharaoh that he might reveal his glory and his power. God had mercy on Moses that he might deliver the people of Israel. The issue is not a kind of sovereignty by which God chooses some for salvation and condemns others to hell. God is choosing in his sovereignty one for a role of service. Remember, it's chosen to service. A serious error, error can be made when we compare Moses and Pharaoh saying that God chose Moses spiritually and rejected Pharaoh spiritually. God chose both Israel and Pharaoh for a role of service, and he used both of them not only despite their hardness of heart, but even because of it. In Exodus chapter 7 through 14, we see many times that Pharaoh hardened his heart towards God. And then we see many times where God comes along and hardens Pharaoh's heart. That can be kind of confusing for us. Brenda and I even had a discussion about that this week. Exodus 4, 21, God tells Moses this, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so he will refuse to let my people go. See, even in Pharaoh's hardness of his heart, God used that and hardened it even more to get his purpose done, to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. It said the same sunlight that melts the ice also hardens the clay. This did not cause Pharaoh to be lost, nor did it somehow intensify his lostness. God's purpose for Pharaoh was to be an instrument for displaying God's power and for proclaiming God's name in all the earth. God has a heart for all the nations. He wants all the nations to come to know him, to believe in him, to have faith in him. But some nations just choose not to follow. Pharaoh was choosing not to follow. God's sovereignty in choosing for service includes the prerogative of choosing and using someone without saving them. Pharaoh is a premier example of just this. So Paul is simply wanting the Jews to see that the same principle applied to them as a nation. They could serve God's purpose, whether as individuals they were believers or not. They're still part of the whole physical plan of being God's chosen people. They're the physical Jews. Some of them are going to choose not to follow. In fact, a majority of them. And that leads us into the third section. We're going to start to get over here to the spiritual Jews and understanding what this is all about. In verses 19 through 29, we're going to see the consistency of God is illustrated. He is consistent. God is faithful. That's what I keep seeing all throughout this chapter. Let's look at verses 19 through 24. We're getting to some of my favorite sections here. Well, then you might say, why does God blame people for not listening? Haven't they simply done what he made them do? No, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to criticize God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who made it, why have you made me like this? God has every right to exercise his judgment and his power, but he also has the right to be very patient with those who are the objects of his judgment and are fit only for destruction. He also has the right to pour out the riches of his glory upon those he, pre he prepared to be the objects of his mercy, even upon us who he selected, both from the Jews and from the Gentiles. We're, gonna, we're seeing some new stuff here. The fact of God's sovereign will only seems to cause a new problem and more questions. If God is sovereign, 
haven't they simply done what he made them do? Are we all just doing what God makes us do? It's the age-old question of the justice of God as he works in human history. We know that God by nature is just. He's not just just, he's perfectly just. He cannot be unjust. Genesis 18 verse 25 says this, Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? That's a capital J because it's talking about God. God is the judge. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Warren Wiersbe in his commentary says this, It is unthinkable that God would will an unjust purpose or perform an unjust act. But at times, it seems that he does just that. Doesn't it? Most first century Jews assumed that God's calling them into his covenant service guaranteed their final salvation. They thought since they were part of this physical Jews, part of the bloodline, that they automatically got this side too, just by being a Jew, a part of Abraham's bloodline. God has a perfect plan. And Paul is saying, are you as a created being to challenge the one who created you? Are you going to challenge God's perfect plan? I think Paul's just saying, just follow the plan. He has a perfect plan through Jesus. You see, God is the potter. And guess what? We are the clay. We can't become anything without the potter. The clay just sits there as a lump. The potter can make one vessel out of it or can choose to make two. God used the nation of Israel, physical Jews, to accomplish his redemptive purpose by bringing the Messiah himself into the world and Paul clearly illustrates with the same lump of clay the potter can make a jar for decoration and a jar for garbage therefore this honor of being the physical Jews chosen to service belongs to both believing and unbelieving Jews in the end of verse 22 uh, where it says the objects of judgment are fit only for destruction man that's a, that was a tough uh, passage for me and I'm like, now how does it, it just sounds like he's choosing, that he's making that choice. And how do I understand this butter? And I had to dig into some things. I, I admit, I did not take Greek in college, so I had to use some um, knowledge from some other people. I started digging in, and I found out that fit only for destruction does not mean that Pharaoh and others like him are objects of judgment. The verb fit here is what the Greek scholars call the middle voice, making it a reflexive action verb. Okay? I don't know a lot about what that means. Okay, I'll admit it. But here's the way it would sound better, being a reflexive verb. A better way to understand it, according to some, a bunch of other smarter people that I read, is this. The objects of judgment have fitted themselves for destruction. See, it comes back to this. We don't just get it because we're part of this bloodline. We have to make the choice. As individuals, it's not as a whole... We as a church don't get to just go to heaven because we're Northside Christian Church. We each have to make a personal decision. And it comes from that spiritual choice of choosing Jesus. God prepares men for glory, but sinners prepare themselves for judgment. Since none of mankind deserves mercy, God cannot be charged with injustice. But when it comes to eternal destinies, God exercised his sovereign right, and like a potter, to make a distinguishing characteristic of faith in his son Jesus Christ to enter spiritual Israel. For the first time in this chapter, Paul reveals the fact that believing Gentiles are also included within the spiritual Israel. So our circle is going to start to look a little bit different here. The big circle is still going to involve unbelieving Jews. But Jesus is uh, adding a different circle, right? We've still got the believing Jews. But then we've also got the believing Gentiles. And what's God call this? The church. It's a church. We're all here as Gentiles, I would assume most of us, I'm a Gentile, and because God has now allowed Gentiles, he didn't before when he started, right? It was the Jews that were chosen, Pharaoh, Egypt, Gentiles, they didn't make the choice. Now God is using the Gentiles and including them in his church. I love this next section of scripture. I love prophecy. 
And the remainder of this section of scripture is a series of quotations from Hosea and Isaiah. And they are prophetic confirmations of God's purpose to build his church through both the believing Jews and the Gentiles. Look at what he says in verses 25 through 29. Paul says this, concerning the Gentiles, God says in the prophecy of Hosea, those who were not my people, I will now call my people. And I will love those who I did not love before. And he also says, once they were told, you are not my people. But now he will say, you are children of the living God. Concerning Israel, Isaiah the prophet cried out, though the people of Israel are as numerous as the sand of the seashore, only a small number will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth quickly and with finality. And Isaiah said in another place, if the Lord Almighty had not spared a few of us, we would have been wiped out as completely as Sodom and Gomorrah. I find it amazing that these very things that Paul is experiencing with the church in Rome, he's actually living them, and they were prophesied hundreds of years earlier in Hosea and Isaiah. I know many of us struggle with this idea of God being completely just and at the same time being this God of incredible love and grace and mercy. I struggle with it myself because it is impossible for anyone to do but God. If you're a father out there, or even a mother, you may relate to this, but I I'm terrible at this as a father. Uh, a absolutely awful. I make rules in the house for my kids like all of us do as parents, right? And then I have to be the just one but the loving one. And when you have these cute little girls, all I want to do is be loving. I don't want to be just at all, to be honest. Uh, but it doesn't turn out good, because then you have rotten little kids, right? We know that. I've got some 20-year-olds. I know that can happen. Uh, a few weeks ago, Becca did something really bad, and she'd done it for the second time. And God started speaking to me, uh, even before I started studying for this, because I hadn't really punished. I'd shown a lot of mercy the first time. And here this came back, because I'd shown too much mercy, I think, really. It was my fault more than it was hers. Maybe. She did it. Uh, but it was time to throw down some justness. Some justness. And uh, it was obvious that she took advantage of the, uh, the mercy, and I needed to punish. It happened on a Wednesday night. I'm getting ready for small groups. Brenda calls me. She ends up not coming to small groups. Makes her eat dinner alone, which was probably her biggest punishment. She took away her tablet, did all these things. She's crying and all this stuff, so they didn't come. And she told her, your dad will punish you when you get home. You've heard that before, right? Everybody's experienced that, right? I'm like, great, thank you. I know I need to do that. I, need to, I know I need to do it, though. The justice needs to come down. But I just couldn't do it. It's Saturday, okay? This happened Wednesday. Saturday, Brenda's going to get her hair done, and she's like, John, you, you, have, to, you have to go talk to your daughter and, and do this punishment thing, what you're going to do. And I, So I took Becca, she left, I took Becca up to her room, and and we prayed together, and we read scripture together, and we both cried together, and then she got punishments. She got uh, punishment, but then she, uh, you know, I wrote sentences all my life. I will not talk in class. I will not pass notes in class. I will not talk in class. I will not, I will, I will not talk in class probably thousands of times. And then look at me. Here I am talking. The teacher only knew. Keep talking. Just don't do it in class. So I made her write scripture. That was one of her punishments. Guys, we don't have to be perfect. Thank goodness as fathers, as mothers, as people, because we serve a God who is perfect. And he has a perfect plan. And he is faithful with that plan. And he sent his perfect son, Jesus, who lived a perfect life on this earth and then sacrificed it for us so that we could be redeemed. The tragic irony of all of this and why Paul is talking about this is that the Jews were lost. Most of them were lost. They didn't get it. Paul says in the beginning of the chapter, that they just didn't get it and he ached and hurt for them he wanted to even for them to be saved he would give up his salvation and it was all because they refused to become a part of the very group whose origin was a major reason for their own existence they couldn't trust god's plan and i just want to say to us today just let it go and trust god's plan don't be like the israelites Wayne is going to share uh, next week in more detail of this perfect plan as he goes through the end of Romans 9 and into chapter 10. And it will show the difference between the two Israels is justification by grace through faith. You see, physical Israel seeks to be justified by their own righteousness. They thought they got to be a part of it just because of their bloodline. While spiritual Israel accepts Christ's salvation through faith. 
And I just want to challenge each and every one of you today, and I'm challenging myself, don't make the same mistake. We just need to continue to trust God's plan and choose Jesus. And as we prepare for a time of communion, a special time in our service that we do every week, where we remember what Christ has done on that cross, how he gave his body, his body was broken, his blood was shed for each and every one of us. Corey's going to lead us in a song before communion, and I want you to hear some of the words before we sing them. I want you to think about them. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. Father God, I thank you for Jesus, that we each have this individual choice, and we just need to choose Jesus. Father, may we choose you now and follow you forever. We pray all this in Jesus' name.